It's not every day that the canon of organ music accepted in church services gets a new addition. Hans Zimmer's organ-scored soundtrack for the movie Interstellar might be the first for decades. I don't know, maybe this is sacrilegious, but I would say if you wanted to pack out the service in a big cathedral, show Interstellar. Hans Zimmer in a gothic cathedral? Come on. (laughs) I'm fun there. Making this comment in an interview with my friend Paul Anleitner, I was being a little ironic, but I think Interstellar was made for the job. If Hans Zimmer's score evokes the transcendent qualities of the greatest hymns, and Christopher Nolan's IMAX cinematography is composed for a screen the size of a cathedral, then Jonathan Nolan's script goes a step further, drawing directly from the Bible myths bred in church services. None of this is accidental. Interstellar is a movie designed from the first frame to the last to be a religious experience for the scientific imagination. On its surface, Interstellar is the kind of science fiction story we all know and love. There are astronauts in spacesuits, a lost starship, spatial anomalies, time dilation, and, of course, interstellar journeys. The first story of interstellar exploration was written by the French philosopher Voltaire in 1752. Micromegas describes the journey of an alien being between the stars. It was the first story to show space shaped by gravity and introduced many readers to the Newtonian universe as we know it today. British philosopher Olaf Stapledon, inspired by the astronomical discoveries of Edwin Hubble, began to imagine the true scale of both interstellar space and time in his novel Star Maker, a book C.S. Lewis described as sheer devil worship for its depiction of our universe as the random creation of a star maker to whom it was just one of millions they had made. But it was not until the 1960s and 70s, in novels like Tau Zero by Paul Anderson, that science fiction began to tussle with the relative universe revealed by Albert Einstein. The starship Leonora Christine is accelerated to near the speed of light, and her crew become the last humans after experiencing radical time dilation. From Newton to Hubble to Einstein, a host of science fiction narratives from Planet of the Apes to Star Trek have helped to show us the universe revealed with each new scientific discovery. Interstellar adds to our evolving mythos of space. With physicist Kip Thorne advising, Interstellar attempts a realistic vision of interstellar exploration. From the design of the Starship Endurance to the physics of alien worlds and the most complete visualization of a black hole, all credible possibilities, at least within the speculative framework of a sci-fi fantasy. But beneath its science fiction surface, Interstellar has another story to tell. It's a story drawn from an older mythos that many scientists and sci-fi fans believe disproven. The mythos of Christianity and the story of Christ. Christopher Nolan isn't the first Hollywood auteur director to make a modern myth from science fiction. Interstellar contains a multitude of nods and winks to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, a starship on a journey to a space anomaly, an astronaut transcending space and time, and oodles of A-list actors in spacesuits, the motif of sci-fi that Kubrick made cool forever in his masterpiece. But the main debt of Nolan's movie to Kubrick's is the belief that For man to reach the stars, we will have to transcend the limitations of time and space, at least as we perceive them. Kubrick presents that transcendence as a psychedelic trip for the hippie generation. The Nolan brothers' vision of the transcendent comes wrapped in much more traditional symbolism. The realization of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. No such thing as a ghost, dumbass. Hey. I looked it up. It's called a poltergeist. Let's assume that Cooper and Brand get it on in the new world, giving birth to Son of Cooper. 
sent down to Earth to sit in judgment upon a seven-headed space station with the four androids of the apocalypse, it's the sequel we've all been waiting for, Interstellar 2 Revelations. Praise Jesus! Have you ever wondered why Matthew McConaughey's character in Interstellar has the initials JC? Why Matt Damon Remarkable Dr. Man turns out to be satanically evil? And we all know that Matt Damon isn't satanically evil, don't we? Why Anne Hathaway wastes valuable time delivering a speech about the power of love. Love isn't something we invented. We're going to go through a point-by-point -point analysis of every Christian symbol in the movie Interstellar. But first I want to head off a few of the objections I see flying towards me from a future YouTube comment section. First, this is a projection. There's nothing Christian about my favourite sci-fi movie, thank you very much. Well, okay, but the Christian symbolism in Interstellar is not subtle, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. Second, Interstellar is spiritual but not religious. Saying you're spiritual but not religious is like saying you're the colour ivory but not the colour beige. A minute distinction between two different terms that in practice nobody can tell the difference between. Third, to those of you saying Demo, this is not the first analysis of the Christian symbols in Interstellar. Yes, you are correct. But I have read in detail all of the major essays on the movie Interstellar. And even those that identify some of the symbols tend to misidentify their meaning. And when they do that, they all insist that despite the Christian symbolism, Interstellar is not a religious movie. I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm insisting that Interstellar is a religious experience. The 18 Christian symbols in Interstellar. One, Joseph is the father of Christ. Two, a cooper is a carpenter who makes barrels. Three, the initials JC equal Jesus Christ. Four, we first see Cooper falling from the heavens down to earth. Five, Cooper is 33 when he leaves earth, the age of Jesus. Six, we are told Cooper's story in the former testimony by those looking back at the events. Seven, earth is blighted by a biblical plague. Eight, everyone is a farmer again, like the Bible characters. Nine, the people are being led to a new world by a wise old prophetic man. Professor Brian. Ten, Lazarus is the name of a human raised from the dead by Jesus. Eleven, there are twelve archangels and twelve ranger pilots. You once said the Dr. Man was the best of us. Twelve, the twelfth ranger pilot, the best of us, is Dr. Man who has fallen to evil. Let's stop and think about Dr. Man. He is Satan, the Lucifer of Milton's Paradise Lost, the being of high intellect who believes he can save the world, but that same power of intellect has led him also to fear, lies, violence, and murder. This is a core Christian belief that the rational reasoning mind represented as Satan or Lucifer, or as the scientist Dr. Man, is the root of evil and the cause of humankind's fall into mortal existence. Hence his name, man. Notably, Kubrick in 2001 makes the same argument without the Christian frame. The same mind that invents technology also uses it for violence. 13. Love transcends time and space. Love isn't something we invented. It's observable, powerful. It has to mean something. Love has meaning, yes. Social utility, social bonding, child rearing. We love people who have died. Let's stop again and think about Anne Hathaway's speech on love. The speech is a description of the Christian principle of agape, 
or unselfish love that is given without expectation of a return, the love of a mother for a child. But in the scientific worldview, love cannot be materially real. It is only a behavioral byproduct of evolutionary forces or utilitarian social drives. However, Brand's speech suggests a way to make love compatible with science by formulating it as higher dimensional. Maybe it means something more, something we can't yet understand. Maybe it's some evidence, some artifact of a higher dimension that we can't consciously perceive. Which takes us to the conclusion of Interstellar. 14. Self-sacrifice to save humankind. Cooper chooses to sacrifice his life to literally save all humankind in frozen form. Ranger 2, prepare to detach. What? No! No! Cooper! 3. Cooper, what are you doing? Moon's third law. Leave Cooper's crucifixion is the fall into Gargantua, flanked by Tars and Case, who represent the good thief who joins Christ in heaven and the unrepentant thief who takes the fall. 15. A higher dimensional heaven. The Tesseract places Cooper beyond dimensions of space and time. It's math heaven. <sighs> 16. The Human Trinity. From the Tesseract, Cooper, the father, is able to commune with his earlier self, the son, via gravity fluctuations. The ghost. It's not a ghost. It's gravity. 17. Relativity Resurrection. The physics of relativity and the phenomenon of time dilation allow Cooper to be resurrected just in time to realize what an awful father he is. 18. Adam and Eve. Cooper goes back to be with Brand and they become Adam and Eve to the frosty frozen next generation of humankind. So there we have it. Interstellar is two movies in one. It's a somewhat scientifically rigorous depiction of interstellar exploration and it's the story of Space Jesus. Then it brings the two stories together to suggest that perhaps the human dream of existence beyond space and time, of life after death, might be scientifically possible in higher dimensions beyond space and time. And that love might be the higher dimensional force holding reality together, i.e. God. The Christian symbolism of interstellar is only the beginning. Go and learn about 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, the movie that destroyed science fiction.